Hello, and welcome back to the channel. In today's topic, subway workers and tunnel rats describe their creepiest encounters in the underground. Don't forget to like and subscribe. There's an abandoned insane asylum in Northville, Michigan that my friends and I explored three times. This is the story of the third and final time we ever broke in. I still get chills every time I remember this night. The first two times we went, the asylum was actually more interesting than creepy to explore. Both times we happened to run into very friendly people there, the first time we ran into another group of high school kids, scared the shit out of them at first, the second time we met a couple stoner Vietnam vets that gave us a tour of the place, it's an entire complex complete with underground tunnels, morgue, and lots of files and things from the 50s. This time, however, we were alone, and only had two flashlights between three people. Much like the guy with the story about the World War II base, the echoing footsteps sound like they're coming from behind you, and always seem to take one more step after you stop. So after exploring much of the asylum like this and being considerably creeped out already, we decide to head to the main building. It's about 18 stories tall and the view from the top is pretty cool, because it's by far the tallest building anywhere remotely close, and you can see Detroit from up there. Anyway, we're nearing the top of the seemingly endless stair corridor, when the girl that's with us freezes, and whispers for us to stop. I heard footsteps she whispers. I tried to tell her it was just her footsteps echoing, but when both of them made me shut up and listen I could hear it clear as day, the unmistakable sound of footsteps coming from the top floor. Now the building is tall, but very small area-wise, so we were very close to the sounds. Still standing on the stairs, we whisper amongst us about what we're going to do. My very stupid friend insists that it's probably just another friendly person and we should go up and say hi. I try to explain to him that you don't want to meet the kind of people that pace the top floor of an old asylum in the middle of the night. We couldn't convince him and he goes to head up the stairs, but I was like fuck this and just started running down the stairs. Fortunately he followed us, and we got out of there without ever finding out who, or what, was walking around up there that night. To top it all off. A cop passing by on the road spotted us after coming out of the building and we had to run into the asylum complex to get away. I still think back to that night sometimes and wonder who was up there. There were definitely no guards, so it was probably either a gang, there's gang graffiti all over the asylum, for the guppies, or the tortured soul of a crazy person. Either way, that was way to close. Where I grew up there were a few storm drains that all went to the same pond. My friend A and I were messing around in the woods near one of the openings and we could hear this really sharp echoing cry that made us both nervous. We thought it was the wind at first and then A threw a rock into the opening and it stopped for a minute so at this point we figured it must be something alive. We climbed back out of the woods and went to the next pipe and could hear it there too. Now I'm scared and A is trying to prove how he's not afraid of anything so on we go to the next one. This one is quieter so we go back in the other direction. Now I'm being a baby because it's raining a little and I'm not supposed to get my clothes wet, I was around 9, so I'm begging A to go home. As he stops to assure me we are safe we hear this horrible, deep, wailing noise and I start to panic. I can feel my pulse in my neck and I'm sweating and A puts his face into the opening for the drain. The noise happens again and A takes off down the hill and into the pipe opening. I am now crying because A abandoned me in the rain and there's a monster in the pipes. A starts yelling my name and I have to put my face to the opening to hear him so now I'm really crying and he tells me to call the fire department so I run to the nearest neighbor and tell them too. I explain I don't know why we need to call but that A is in the pipe outside their house. They get all snotty because A is the heaviest kid in the neighborhood so they assume he got stuck. They call the non-emergency number and a truck comes to remove the cover. Turns out A recognized the sound of an angry cat and ran into the pipe. It was a mama cat and her kittens but the kittens were stuck beneath the wire grate inside the drain so the rain was drowning them and they were crying. Thanks to A they got all but one kitten out and the mama cat in time before the rain got worse. He got to keep one of the kittens and no one believed us even though we were both there and there were firemen. No one believed he could fit into the pipe. I'm not sure I qualify, since the explanation seems rather straightforward to me, another group of explorers. Still, I have a pretty good story. I attended the University of Huddersfield, and one of the accommodation facilities for students is called Storitz Hall. Storitz Hall was previously a psychiatric hospital, an asylum. Most of the buildings were demolished, I believe two are currently in use to house students, and then off-site there's the main building and the mortuary. The main building was off-limits and I believe security guards were in place, but when you have several hundred drunk students living nearby you're basically just grabbing sand. 
I went with a group of people and we intended to have some kind of DIY seance, Darren Brown had done his not long before, so we toddled off with tarot cards and a Ouija board. It was all pretty funny to be honest, none of us really took it seriously, and having seen the Darren Brown seance I was really skeptical. Then the torch died, and we heard several loud knocks. We fucked off sharpish. But again, it likely was somebody fucking with us after hearing the panic caused by the torch going out. Might have even been the security guards, I wouldn't blame them. Recently, I was visiting NYC and stayed in a hotel inside the city. It was a fairly nice place, but it was also a pretty old building that was not built with the intention of it getting so much use. For example, there were only two tiny elevators available for guests, and the hotel was at least 15 to 20 floors. The wait for elevators took so long that I decided I'd use the stairs. For some reason, there were four to five stairwells in the building, accessible from each floor and most wound up in different parts of the lobby. I remembered using one of them the day before, and I thought it was stairwell D, so I took it. After descending for a while, I passed level 2. The next exit wasn't marked, but I thought it had to be level 1. I went through the exit door and found myself in an unfamiliar hallway with a very low ceiling, it could only have been about 7 feet, and sparse lighting. It wasn't eerie, but it definitely didn't look like it was intended for guests. Still, a little curious, I decided to check it out and see if I could find the lobby. I walked for a minute down a long hallway with a kind of dirty stone floor and some industrial double doors. There didn't seem to be anyone around and it was pretty quiet. I rounded a corner and to my immediate right was this big window set into the wall. Through it was a clean white room that reminded me a little of my high school's cafeteria, I remember thinking that, but I'm not sure exactly why. There was also a man, sitting and looking at his phone. He must have been about 5 feet away from me and only the window separated us. He saw me and looked a little startled. I waved and was about to ask where the lobby was but he quickly pointed for me to turn back. Neither of us ever said a word. It was just the weirdest experience being in such a silent, dirty place and then seeing a modern room with a person. I speed walked out and took the elevator. In retrospect, I probably just stumbled into some storage area under the lobby, it definitely wasn't the same level, but it was the strangest discovery, and I like to imagine what could have gone on down there and why I wasn't allowed to be there. So I've done a lot of things like this and there is usually an explanation for anything that seems untoward. Disused metal hospitals, train tunnels, sewers, abandoned stations, utility tunnels, military installations, the lot, it's usually just your mind if you think something is weird. One story that springs to mind was being in a storm drain in London. The storm drains are generally dry but there might be water elsewhere, the tunnels can stretch for miles at a time. We would always listen out for moving water and any changes in air pressure or temperature, just to know whether there was going to be any change in water level or something dumped into the tunnel further up the line. I was in this sewer and there was a massive gust of wind. No idea what caused it but the chap I was with looked at me and we both just said we are leaving, right now. We stomped up the tunnel and made our way out into a dry night. Something in that change of air pressure and temperature told us something and I'm not sure what it was, but we both knew that leaving there and then was the right thing to do. When exploring with a bunch of friends at the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. While this is not underground in its entirety, portions of it are. The buildings were left with hospital equipment, beds, books, patient files. Literally everything. It's eerie as if a zombie apocalypse occurred and everyone left. It operated from 1864 to 1994. The facility was self-sustaining, i.e. the patients farmed the land, and had all resources on campus. The years this was open a lot of horror stories came out of this place, this wasn't the modern-day psychiatric ward. More like a prison, where families paid a lot of money to hide their mentally ill, or the state put undesirables. There's an underground network, that was heavily blocked off with chains. However, the main buildings were easily accessible. But, the access ways to the underground were blocked off inside as well. Every time we got near one of the underground tunnel systems we could hear faint music playing, sounded like a music box playing. We found a bent wired gate and attempted to file in, the music got louder and we were all pretty freaked out. We were all promptly arrested before attempting to go into the tunnels. There's a lot of speculation about the tunnels still to this day. The new owner said he was afraid of asbestos, and was fearing for our safety. He was very grim, he agreed to drop charges if we never went back. We obliged happily. Still, I sometimes think of my interactions there, all of the remnants left behind and get severely creeped out. Although it's technically not urban exploring, as a former electrician I think I can still share one moment from a job I had to do about 13 years ago. Me and my job partner were called out to a larger restoration job that was being done to an older house from the early 1900s. The house was until this point, 
a family-owned house which had two owners since it was built, and the last owner was an old lady who had passed away there whilst being the last person in her family line, sad story on its own, and nobody could take over the house. So the house got auctioned to a younger couple that bought it for an insane amount of money due to how large the house was, but it was now time to get the old house up to modern standards, which included a completely new installation from scratch, as the old cables around the house were the type of cables that was insulated with black cotton and fastened with handcrafted wooden clamps. While working in the first floor was quite easy as the entire installation process was made to fit inside the new wall frames that the carpenters were setting up, we eventually had to move on to the second floor and prepare for setting up a new intake from the attic which would then pass down to the new main fuse box on the second floor. We opened the hatch to the attic, and while using the flashlight to look up there, we could surely see that the attic was very cramped, so the smallest of us would have to go up there to fix everything to get the intake cable settled while removing the old one. As you might guess, I was the smallest of us and had to do that shitty job of going up where nobody probably had been for many many years. So I decided to grab a lunch break and mentally prepare myself for what I expected to become a pretty shit job. After eating, I grabbed my flashlight and tool belt and started climbing up the stairs, and while climbing upwards I noticed that the smell, that we thought was pretty much old people's smell after they die, was getting increasingly stronger. But I had to continue, so I got to the top and crawled myself onto something stable when I got up while noticing that the smell up there was pretty damn bad. So I grabbed my flashlight to look around and get somewhat oriented about where to crawl. Looking forward it seemed like a pretty straightforward route towards the intake point that I could see in the distance, but out of curiosity I wondered if there were anything up there, so I looked to my right, only to light up five carcasses of what once was the old lady's cats that probably had died, one of them were more or less intact whilst being visibly partly eaten by various insects, or whatever eats such stuff while two of them were more or less just rotten dried skin and bones. At that moment I absolutely regretted my decision to eat lunch as the sight of this along with the realization about what I had smelled all along was these dead cats, and immediately threw up on the spot before very swiftly noping the fuck out of there. After some talk back and forth, we came to the possibility that the old lady had been throwing her cats up there when they died, one by one, but we will never know for sure since the lady had died. The new owners had no idea about this when buying the house, but our company ended up denying to continue the work until the attic had been cleaned appropriately. This apparently took them about one month to complete, I guess there are not many companies who wants to deal with that kind of nasty stuff, but my partner at work ended up finishing the work on the attic afterwards as he felt kinda bad for me. In the end, I decided to not continue being an electrician anymore, as this was not work I really enjoyed doing, especially not after this event. I used to do a lot of exploring in my younger days, mainly when my friends and I would skip school and decide our time was better spent finding new places to explore than actually learning in a structured environment smile. I should mention I am an Australian, just in case anyone wanted to do any type of research on any of these places. One of our favorite places to explore was a place called White Bay Power Station which was a coal-powered station that closed its doors on Christmas Day 1983. We were exploring between the years of 1997 and 2000 so the decay had well and truly set in by this time. On a side note films such as The Matrix Reloaded and Mission Impossible had parts filmed here. Anyway, this place was absolutely huge. It has all of the usual abandoned adornments such as graffiti and satanic signs and messages scrawled over the walls, there was also a time we went and found a freshly dead pigeon which had a noose around its neck. It was also multi-leveled. The exact number of levels were hard to determine because it would all depend on which flight of stairs you took, which part of the power station you entered from and which actual part of the power station you were in. On some flights of stairs you could be 8 floors up and be able to see through the metal staircase you were standing on due to it decaying from rust. The most dangerous thing about this place was the way some levels would just drop off, there would be a big concrete platform then nothing, no railings or anything to stop you falling off. There was also a door which we opened that took us onto the roof, a roof I nearly fell off because I got dizzy from the sheer height of the roof. Though the scariest part of the whole power plant were the big chutes they used to store the coal in. This is hard to explain but I will try my best. Imagine having two thin metal catwalks on either side of huge metallic voids. You couldn't see more than four feet in front of you on the catwalks because of the sheer darkness and the inside of the voids that the coal was stored in were the blackest darkness you can imagine. So basically standing on these catwalks were much like walking the plank, except you can't see anything in front of you and if the floor below you gave way you were done for. We also used to frequent old train tunnels in Sydney, it was quite startling to be walking through a pitch black tunnel, come around a bend and see the light from the other side, with the figure of a person walking towards you. This used to happen pretty often as the homeless and drug users would take refuge in the tunnels to either get out of the elements or to take drugs. Funnily enough, 
Some of the best tunnels were put back into use for the 2000 Sydney Olympic tram services. Now they are all cleaned up and well lit. Another type of place we used to explore a lot were underground canals and drainage tunnels. We got so good at mapping them out that we knew which tunnels to take to get us as close as possible to fast food outlets for lunch. We found one weird tunnel one day, we were walking along and noticed an offshoot which made us drop to our knees and crawl. At the end of this tunnel there was what I could best describe as a small water reservoir. The water in it was only about an inch lower than the pipe we are in and had a newish looking ladder about 5 foot away on the left side of the pipe we are currently crouched in and a metal grate above it. We had to maneuver ourselves on an angle right on the lip of the pipe and jump and grab the ladder and climb out of the grate. We found out pretty quickly that the whole thing looked so new because we were now standing in someone's backyard ha ha. There used to be an abandoned rubber factory on the edge of my town before it was torn down a couple years back. I went there once and tried all the doors but they were barred, but I did find a crack in the concrete wall around the back that was just big enough to slip through. The inside was really neat. There were abandoned boats that must have been in storage for decades there, a bunch of old conveyor belts and factory equipment, all kinds of drug paraphernalia. I found a random painting of Jesus in a makeshift shrine. But that's not the creepy part. I was walking around this abandoned factory at about 8 pm, just after dark. I look around for an hour or so. And aside from some old shit there's really nothing out of the ordinary. Then I hear music start playing, something sort of blues a somewhere in the factory. I'm not easily scared, and I kind of wanted to figure out what sort of freak was listening to old records in an abandoned factory because that's something I would do. I track down the noise after about 5 to 10 minutes and it's in this room in the basement that has the doorway covered with a tarp. I go inside and the room is a huge contrast from the rest of the dingy, dull old factory. The walls were bright purple, and the room was warm like there was a space heater in it whereas the rest of the factory was freezing. There's a cassette player on the floor playing a song, which I later tracked down to be called Eleanor Rigby by the Beatles, but I never found out what the other songs were, and a bunch of papers taped to the walls that all say she gotta run. She gotta run. She gotta run. If I were to guess, there were at least 100 sheets that said the exact same phrase just plastered on the walls and laying on the floor. There was a chair that looked like it had been detached from a school desk in the corner and a statue of an animal that was really badly chipped and burned, like someone was trying to destroy it. There was also a stack of VHS tapes that had the names of women on the sides, I only remember seeing Jessica on multiple but there were a few other names. I left shortly after because I got worried whoever owned all this shit would come back and find me there, and I figured they were in the building with me. I couldn't stop thinking about it for a few weeks. I was convinced it was either a serial killer or some guy with a porn collection that he couldn't risk having at home, or something worse on the tapes, and went back with a friend, but when we got there they had already started demolishing the place and it was inaccessible. I'll always wonder what was on those tapes, but part of me is glad I don't know. I'm an urban explorer, but nearly everything I've done was above ground. But there was an old farmhouse near me, now demolished, which I explored several times, including the basement. I'd say the time something unexplained happened were something like less than 5% of my expeditions, but I had several in this house. It had been abandoned for at least 30 years, was in very poor shape, and used to be a big party spot for teens. A friend can recall waking up on the lawn one morning, still drunk, surrounded by empty bottles. The basement had a bunch of the usual laughable wannabe satanic tagging across one wall in red paint, and religious messages in black countering it on the opposite wall. The underground experience happened one night as three or four of us were walking up the staircase out of the basement, which had solid walls on both sides. As we did, each person in turn, from top down, got their shoulder bumped, as though a person were going down past us as we were going up. I might as well mention the non-underground ones, too, in case someone asks. The second floor ceiling was damaged, but we did go up the attic stairs, and when shining a light towards the other end, we each saw what seemed to be a human face and only a face down there, not moving. The windows were all boarded over, but one on the second floor had the board nailed only at the top, it was bent open outward, the lower end held out by a chunk of wood. On one visit with some newbies, we looked up and saw that it was closed. The newbies thought the place looked to run down to be safe, and when they uncovered a statue among the weeds in the yard, elected to poke around there. When the rest of us got upstairs, the board was bent open as usual, and we looked out and saw the others in the yard and I'm still kicking myself for not shouting down to them because when we got back outside, it was shut again. I remember having an experience once while not in break rules take pics mode I was just riding on my local, subway? Underground slow train basically. It got even slower because of a bend in the tracks. 
I always loved this area to look out of the windows because it was super old and super big spanning out into like an ancestral cave if you knew the angles to look, they tried to make it look all posh and hidden, and it's almost impossible to get down into there without tripping one of the 15 plus security systems, I suppose homeless could probably figure it out, usually the most exciting thing I saw was a construction vehicle. This day I saw a person hopefully just sleeping in a little cubby I thought I was the only one to know about. Threw me off balance a little bit. I almost reported it but decided if I was in that situation and alive I wouldn't want someone to report me and if I was dead I wouldn't care so decided not to. When I was 11 I moved from a small town, app, 15k, to a largish city, metro area 3 plus million. We lived in an apartment complex near a major highway, and next to the highway was a large drainage area, like a small shallow concrete lake, and there were storm sewer tunnels all over the area. My friends and I explored them and to this day I could probably draw you a partially accurate map of those tunnels 33 years ago. We learned which ones went under the laundromat and got real hot, which ones got narrower as you went down them, etc. Some of these tunnels we went and had to go at least a half mile, and if you included the little open interchange areas underneath manholes, you could go from the creek at a nearby park to the far side of the highway nearly a mile away. This terrified my mother, but she eventually said she realized she couldn't keep me out of the tunnels so she made sure I had flashlights and told her whenever I was going in the tunnels. Scary part, my best friend had slowly dared each other to go farther down the tunnels without flashlights until we were comfortable traversing the entire system in near total darkness. One of our other friends wanted to go in the tunnels, we didn't like him very much so we took him with us, and about halfway through one of the longest tunnels we turned off the flashlights and ran, or rather, scurried, away, leaving him crying in the dark for us to come help him. We didn't, but eventually he found his way out and I got in some trouble over that. Another time, my friend said he heard some big kids, probably teenagers in hindsight, in our tunnel system, and we felt very territorial about it. They had gone down one of the tunnels that gets narrower as you travel down it, it got too small for even us little kids before it got anywhere. There was a dumpster near the manhole access that led to this tunnel, and we dragged a small mattress out of the trash, shoved it down the manhole, and then lit it on fire. We thought it was hilarious when we could hear the big kids screaming and cursing. We ran away so we wouldn't get our butts kicked and I don't know how they got out but I never heard of kids dying in the storm sewer tunnels so I'm sure they got out okay. I do electrical work for a living and I've been working in old Baltimore lately and most of the buildings in Baltimore are connected by tunnels. So about a few months ago I was working on a building on East Redwood ST putting lights in the tunnels. Well on day on my lunch break I decide to walk around them. So I'm walking for about 20 minutes when I thought I heard my foreman call me down one of the halls, I assume he went to look around as well, so I start to walk down the hall and it started to get deeper and colder, I think about turning around because I don't want to get lost when I hear it again so I a little deeper. Eventually I hit a room about the size of baseball court with probably 20 high ceilings, the ground is all sticky and every step I take sounds like I'm undoing a heavy velcro strap, there are skulls from small animals everywhere in there that shape in a big triangle that points to a very large dog-like skeleton. At this point I'm freezing and really scared, I start to smell a harsh burning smell and hear what sounded like a big dog running on concrete, I can hear it get louder and closer, louder and closer. I start running like I have never ran in my life, finally after what felt like an hour of running at full sprint I run into a staircase with a big heavy metal door at the end of it, I hear the noises now like they are right around the corner. So with all my might and adrenaline fueled strength I rip the door open and slam it behind me and then hear and feel a hard thud against the door. I turn around to see him standing under the docks by the Four Seasons and the Marriott Hotel. I call my boss and tell him I got lost in the tunnels and need to get picked up. Since the day I refused to go in the tunnels under Baltimore or go into sub-basements in Baltimore. After the Community Care Act in Scotland in the early 90s, a lot of the big sprawling long-stay mental hospitals were closed down and all the patients moved into smaller houses and homes etc. spread out through the community. A lot of these old sites are still standing though. In Dundee we have Strathmartine Hospital, the core of which was constructed in the 1800 and expanded. Back in the day it was kind of place you'd be sent if you were an unwed mother or a bad child. The place was bought over to develop into flats, but the owner went bankrupt in the recession, so the whole site is standing there unprotected by security, albeit surrounded by fences and kinda difficult to get to. Me and a few friends have broken in a few time and it's hella creepy. Wards with beds and furniture perfectly preserved, old mass communal bathrooms, open loft shafts, Meds rooms with health posters and medication still there, children's ward with child's pictures still on the wall decades later, mental health wards with seclusion areas, old crematorium, gym and swimming pool. People don't realize these hospitals were entirely self-contained communities. If there's interest, I can upload some pics. A couple of stories though. 
On the children's ward, my friend who was filming, who's a bit of a spiritualist, said she felt a presence and got really anxious. I laughed it off, but when you play the video back, when she expresses that she feels something, the clip is all freakily distorted. Other story is when we were in an L-shaped building, I swear on my life I heard whistling and footsteps coming round the corner. We quickly scrambled and hid, thinking security had found us, but no one was there. I once was alone at Moorgate Station in London after staying for a few after work drinks with my buddy who also works in Central. It was around 10 pm so I left the pub and walked to the station and found I had missed the previous train by about 5 minutes. Moorgate Station is an underground station but the overground trains depart and terminate there. The train that I needed to catch always departs from one of two platforms that are in their individual tunnels adjacent to one another but accessible by foot as they are connected by paths that connect the platforms every 15 feet or so. I was sat on the bench right at the end, near where the front of the train would be when departing. As I sat there I saw some movement in the corner of my eye so I turned and stared to see just a regular guy dressed in dark clothing come through from the other platform passage about 10 meters from me and thought nothing of it. He went by the track, starred down, backed away and ran back through the passage to the other platform. I thought to myself that was weird and quickly got up to follow him and find out why he was running slash if he was okay. I was no more than 5 seconds behind him and the exit slash entry to the platform is right by the other end which was a good 150 meters or so away. As I go through the passage to the other platform I look to see no one there. I then went back to the other platform and again I was the only one there apart from a woman who just reached the bottom of the escalator to the platform entrance right down the other end. It was something I couldn't explain and I was sure I couldn't recall any footsteps that made is even weirder. London is an old place and has a lot of history so not sure if there was an event that could give reasoning to what I experienced but it's a memory that will always stick with me. I currently attend a state university full time. By the description you might be able to figure out which one. I'm currently a senior living in private housing downtown, but sophomore year I lived in the university's only downtown quad. It was built in the early 1920s and definitely looked at compared to the uptown campus and housing quads. I was in the basement lounge area grabbing my mail when I noticed a nearby door that wasn't usually open and a nearby maintenance worker. I casually asked the guy what was down there. He said, Dunno, we just store our materials on the stairs. My curiosity got the better of me and I asked him if I could take a look to see what was all the way at the bottom of the flight of stairs. He said, I don't see why not, just don't get hurt on anything down there, and try to be back before my supervisor gets back in 15. This guy should definitely have not let me down there because he clearly hadn't seen it. There was friable asbestos literally everywhere, particularly the decomposing ceiling tiles. I turned on my phone flashlight to find that it was some kind of sealed off research area. The stairs led to a hallway which looks like it may have been hospital like at one time, but it had since experienced some heavy water damage. There were approximately 7 rooms on either side with one way glass pane in each, with some kind of 90s intercom panel to the right. Inside each room were heavily rusted bed frames, a sink, and a toilet. All the way at the end of the hall were a series of file cabinets. I would have looked to see what they contained but figured it would only be a cloud of black mold spores, so I decided against it. Nothing inherently creepy about the area I suppose but definitely interesting. There's an old half torn down school on the airbase outside of my hometown. The supposedly haunted old grain silos about a quarter mile away get more attention, but the school is what me and my friends were obsessed with. We had gone in during the day and poked around, finding the typical bullshit graffiti teenagers make in places like that, like fuck god with the anarchy symbol and all hail the zodiac killer, stupid shit like that. We wanted to go in at night but didn't want to break our necks doing it, which ended up being a smart choice, since there were holes in the floor that went all the way down to the basement, which seemed to have about just above ankle deep standing water at the time. We didn't get really freaked out until later, when we went back at night, and as we're psyching ourselves up to go in, some kind of early 90s blue Ford and a gun rack pulls into the empty parking lot. Its lights cut right through the car and made it hard to see much, but it spooked the hell out of us. We got the hell out of there, but the truck followed us around the airbase for the better part of half an hour, turning on its high beams and tailgating us, and then turning their lights off completely and acting like they were tailing us, in spite of it only being the two cars on the road at that hour, plus the airbase being, you know, abandoned. We're just glad we were still in the car and not inside when they got there. My grandpa got lost in Mammoth Cave after he got back from World War II. Apparently before he was drafted it was not a national park and the rules around exploring it were very loose, the property it was on was privately owned and locals were known to trespass to explore the cave. Or that's what my grandpa used to tell me, he and his friends very well may have been the only people trespassing. 
While my grandpa was serving in the Pacific Theater the cave became a national park. After arriving home my grandpa and his friends that survived the war went back to explore for old time sakes. They were wandering around with flashlights when they heard a tour group, considering they weren't in there legally and had bypassed many federal trespassing signs, they cut the lights and slowly but surely tried to walk unnoticed back to the entrance. Unfortunately they went deeper and spent 17 hours in there before getting out. He didn't have many stories because apparently you inch along in complete darkness without being able to see your hand in front of your face. But he said one of his friends kept saying we didn't survive that shit to die in here. My buddy and me spent many years crawling through sewer pipes. One day we were out in the woods. Me him and another friend. We were deep in the woods. We found some pipe sticking out of a hillside and agreed to explore it. Well we crawl down this thing a good 600 feet or so, on our hands and knees. At times it gets smaller and we are on our stomachs. Finally it comes to one of those big manhole rooms, and we get the impression we're under a house. Of course Webb also know that in some places manholes will exist in the middle of nowhere for future developments. Anyways the room has three other sewer or small pipes heading off into different directions. Like slither on your stomach size. We choose one and make our friend Z go first. We go down about 300 feet and he shouts back that there is something in the way. He thinks it's a dead animal. But since we are using weak headlamos he can't tell. We coerce him to climb over it. Then comes me. Hess freaking out saying shit is all over his clothes and he didn't know what it was. I climb over this dark lump of refuse. Feels like a body but not human. Not even animal. Just alien. Smells bad. Smells horrible. I slide over this nasty shit almost puking. My buddy behind me comes next. Same story. We keep going. Asking ourselves why we even do this shit in the first place. Exploration. Etc. into the unknown. The forbidden. We crawl another few hundred feet. Z starts complaining about a horrible god awful stench ahead. We can't for the life of him get him to continue. He ends up throwing up. We start throwing the idea around of gas of some sort. He says with his headlamp to is something big up ahead. Looks like a honest to god body. Human maybe. We slide backwards quickly until we get to the manhole room. We crawl out quickly. We get into the daylight and investigate the shit stuck to our clothes from the thing we slid over. It's dark. Bloody dark. Refuse dark. Looks like fur. We agree that it was probably a trapped animal. Never go back ever again. There used to be an old abandoned school in a town by my house. It was heavily boarded up, and super hard to get into. Well. A friend and I managed to get inside, by climbing up the side of the school via a pipe slash fire escape combo and slipping through a window on the roof. We explored the basement, which was flooded. It was kinda creepy seeing stairs disappear into water. We had just left the gym, when we heard footsteps coming from the doors on the other side of the gym. Scary, especially considering it sounded like it was one person, not another group of explorers like us, and blocking our exit back up to the roof, the only way out otherwise was behind us, through boarded up doors. They sounded like someone who was walking around, and stopping periodically. There was no light coming from that direction, and we couldn't fathom why someone would come into a creepy place like this alone. We waited for the footsteps to stop, then snuck across the gym, peered down the hallways, saw no one, and continued towards the stairs which would lead us back to the roof. Halfway down the hall, we hear someone sprinting behind us. Probably 50 meters away or so, down a typical high school hallway. Now, it is mostly dark in here, but there was a small amount of light coming in through cracks in the window boards. Still, we didn't see anything behind us as we quickly ran up the stairs. We didn't stop until we got back to the fourth floor. We listened for noise, nothing. Hopped out the window and climbed back down the pipe. There's an abandoned and boarded up World War II fort in the southern part of Belgium, that we often sneak into with the scouts. Getting in there requires scaling a sheer wall, where we've placed anchoring points for ropes and climbing gear, next to a relatively busy road. So you're being super quiet, making no light and cowering every time a car passes by so he doesn't spot you in his lights. The atmosphere is set. The moment you enter it, it's like diving into water. Sound stops and the entire place is at a constant 14 degrees Celsius, with a slight breeze passing through. The tunnel is barely large enough for me, slightly broader than the average person, to pass without turning my body sideways. The tunnel is just high enough to work up a decent gate while hunched over. If someone ahead of you blocks a passage for a moment, the breeze stops and it feels like the entire tunnel network takes a breath. Because of the way the tunnels are constructed, they echo in such a way that your own footsteps seem to be coming from behind you. They also seem to take one more step than you do when you stop. 
Of course we don't allow the guys and gals to take any source of light in there, so it's pretty scary overall. So I'm in there, posted at a side passage to ensure everyone takes the same path and doesn't get lost. I go in first, before any of the climbers arrive, so they don't know there are friendly faces in there to help them. I'm in there for a while, just waiting for the first to come by, when I see a dancing little light coming down the long hallway. I quietly settle back in my nook and wait for whoever was smart enough to hide some matches and take them away. The light quietly bobs closer when I realize there aren't any footsteps accompanying it. I poke my head around the corner just in time to see it disappear. I hear no footsteps still. I settle back and wait some more, when I realize I do hear some scuffling. Very faint. Breathing noises, but still very faint. I become aware of a wet heat coming from right in front of me, with a faint smell of. Person, sweat, dirt. Suddenly I realize, there's someone there. Right in front of me. Inches from my face. The breathing stops suddenly, whatever it is is aware of me as well. Whatever or whoever it is, we're both holding our breath, both acutely aware of each other. It takes ages. I'm sitting there, unable to move, speak or breathe properly. The wet heat passes and some minutes later I become aware of very faint light coming from my right side, which soon dissipates and leaves. Some time later still, I hear the familiar stomping of combat boots coming down the hallway from my left. I stop the person, tell them to keep following the passageway and take the first right they come to. Out of curiosity, I ask who went in first. No one, he went in first. Spoiler it was explained much later. The first guy got lost down a dead end side passage and the second girl passed him by. She got nervous from the footsteps and removed her shoes. She saw me poke my head from around the corner and drop the match. She passed me very slowly. One of the later checkpoints said she was crying her eyes out. Spoiler. 